This is a video about technology. Now there's not actually anything wrong with your screen right now. You're actually watching this video in 4K, but I am recording it on a camera that came out in 2004 that was only capable of doing standard definition video. We have come a long way in the last 12 years, but what I'm wondering is what has this done to us creatively? This is a box camera. It is an Ansco B2 Cadet. It was made in the 1930s and these were primarily designed to sell to families because households really didn't own cameras in those days and people like Kodak and Ansco wanted to sell film. So basically this camera is literally designed with no frills. Somebody can just pick it up, push the shutter button, wind the film, and they've taken an image. And that was the whole purpose behind this camera is to make something dead simple to use. What's interesting is when you contrast something like this with modern day cameras where we have a million conveniences, um, ISO performance, you can practically shoot in the dark with some cameras now. When you look at autofocus performance, I'm using autofocus right now to film a video because it will track in real time and stay pretty accurate. Uh, you look at things like burst rate. Um, for instance, the RX100 Mark V that Sony is about to release will shoot 24 frames a second. So essentially you can spray and pray at the same speed a film is made at and then go grab a high res still in the end when you're done. They will do practically anything and the level of automation is very fascinating. I think as a result though, because they can do anything, that as photographers we're really not forced to think very much for ourselves. And I think this is what becomes a little bit controversial about this. But my argument is that, you know, the stuff that we're doing with photo assignments um, that we're about to begin. Putting limitations on yourself as a means to learn from them I think is a very important thing as a photographer. I had a conversation with Brian Anderson who you guys might know from the comments section. Brian's a great guy and uh, he was talking about one of the things he wanted to do as part of photo assignments was to impose some limitations on his camera like shooting with a very small amount of space on his memory card and forcing himself to think about the shot and do things in that order and Brian and I have talked about this before in person. I would even take this a step further and that's why I have the box camera. Allow me to read you a quote. So I'm going to make reference once again to the Amateur Photographer's Handbook by Aaron Sussman, which I mentioned in the intro video to photo assignments. And in here, always the curmudgeon, he states, I have a hunch that there would be more Cartier-Bressons, Edward Weston's, Ansel Adams's, and Edward Steichen's if we all had to start with a box camera and were made to prove that we could use that well before we were allowed to touch another camera. The small aperture of the lens gives a great depth of field, but since this is a feature that cannot be controlled, the amateur photographer using a box camera often runs into trouble with backgrounds. This requires extra care in the choice of camera angle and position. Sensible use of a box camera is a wonderful training in the seeing and creating of a picture. If you can learn to make good pictures with a box camera, then any other kind will prove to be a cinch. When I first read that years ago, I thought, well, the book's a little dated, but there was something with it that stuck with me. And I thought, well, you know, if you're going to be a good photographer, you should be able to essentially work with anything to get a good picture. And so I kind of accepted that as a challenge. And I went ahead, got on eBay, and I ordered up an old box camera. And the first thing you have to learn how to do is make an exposure on these, which is a little more difficult than you think it would be. Now, the camera was designed initially so people could just point and shoot. But what you have to remember is in the 1930s, film speeds were nowhere near what they are now in terms of ISO. 32 was kind of normal, 25 was normal, 50 was starting to get a little high, and sometimes I mean, it wasn't for a while before you could get 100 speed film. So if you look at the way this is set up, uh, typically these have an aperture of about f11, and the shutter speed when they were new was usually 1 30th of a second or 1 50th of a second. Now this camera was made in the 1930s, it's a little tiny spring in there that activates the shutter, and I'm not exactly sure that that's accurate anymore. The other thing is if you put higher speed films in here and you're going to go shoot outside, you're probably going to start overexposing things unintentionally. And that to me was the whole challenge of starting to use this. Um, once I was able to get some exposures and figure out how to do that, I was pretty amazed. I mean, it's got a single element meniscus lens. It's pretty much the same principle as a Holga or even a Diana camera. Um, but the only control that you really have over things is your film speed. And then actually I would use filters over the lens opening as well. And so you could 
use neutral density filters. Usually you're having to bring the exposure down anyway. If you're shooting black and white film, you can use an orange filter or red filter. And these things all have filter factors is what they call it, which affects the light coming in. It actually stops it down for you. So you can get good results out of this camera. And then once you kind of know what you're doing with it, then it's a challenge because it's so vanilla in terms of using it in composition. You have these two little viewfinders that are basically reflex mirrors that sit in there and allow you to sort of compose it up. You do also have to get a feel for what the focus is because it's a fixed focus camera. So things need to be at least six feet from the camera that are going to be in focus. And like Aaron Sussman says in this book, you can't blow out the backgrounds by using a really shallow depth of field. So you've got to be careful with what's in the background and how you place things. Anyway, my point is, is that in thinking through all these things, these are things that they're limitations, but they affect creatively the way you're approaching photography and what you're trying to do with the camera. I'm going to take this a step further since I'm talking about this today. I'm actually going to use this camera when we do some of the photo assignments. And I'm going to probably tomorrow, the next day, go ahead and take it out and I'll do a whole video showing you guys how I use this thing and what you can do to use it. Now, if you are not used to shooting film, I would not recommend something like this. It looks like a lot of fun, but the reason I say that is if you've never shot film before, you're going to get wrapped up in the other difficulties, which are going to be how do you get your film processed? Do you do it yourself? Do you send it out? How do you get your stuff scanned? How do you bring it back? And so unless you're comfortable doing those things, I'm not sure this would be a great place to start, but I don't think this idea is limited only to digital cameras. Let me find something here. Okay. This is an example that is a digital camera, and this is a Canon PowerShot SD300 ELF series. This was given to me for free a couple years ago by a coworker who was cleaning out their desk and said, I don't have room for this. Do you want a free camera? And I'm not one to turn down a free camera. Over the next couple weeks, this became like one of my favorite things. And it was the same principle as the box camera. It's got a lot of limitations on it. First of all, this is a four megapixel camera, which is a lower resolution than most cell phones these days. Knowing that going in though, you can get small prints out of it and you can even share images online, albeit not very high resolution, but that actually creatively impacts what you're going to do compositionally, what the picture is going to look like in the end and how it's presented. And so I think that that's actually a plus for a camera like this. And it's one of the things that I liked about it. The other thing you need to remember is, you know, early point and shoots in the digital era, um, the ISO performance was awful on here. Anything above the base ISO, when you get up to like 400 even, you would start to notice noise and artifacts effects and, and it would start to degrade the image somewhat. So it really needs to be performing at the base ISO to get the best image quality. The base ISO on this camera is 50, which is pretty low, but it still pre presents itself a pretty interesting creative challenge. And you can manually set that to 50 and then thinking, okay, I'm only going to shoot at 50. And I don't remember what the ma maximum aperture is on here. It's 2.8 on the long end, then it goes down to 4.9 as soon as you start zooming. So you're going to have to probably use a tripod for things. You're probably going to have to light correctly. And actually you can get away with 50 if you know how to do indoor lighting. Maybe there's a way you can remotely trigger flashes with this. In fact, I know there is. So it presents itself some other challenges that are going to push your creativity by limiting themselves. The other interesting thing is this does do video. Allow me to show you. So as you can see, you can shoot video on the PowerShot SD300. It is SD quality, which means it is 640 pixels by 4. 80 pixels. The rest of this video I shot in 4K, so you can see the comparison. I actually put this at 100%. So you, at first glance, you probably think, well, there's not much creatively you're going to be able to do with video on here, especially if you blow it down and use the larger black space on the screen. Whoa, 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 hang on just a second. You've got all this black space around here, and you're telling me there's nothing creative you can do with this camera? I mean, what if you started filling it with different videos, and maybe there is something that you can do on here? Again, we're pushing the creative boundaries because we had limitations and now we're being forced to do something new or think in a new way. Oh yeah. Obviously this is a very dated camera by today's standards, but my point is, is that when you put limits on what you're able to do with something, whether that's going really old school with a box camera that has just about no functionality, or whether that's using this little cheap camera you can get for $20 on eBay, when you're trying to figure out something that you can do with it and get the best image possible, you're going to have to start problem solving and you're going to have to start thinking around things. And in this process, you're really going to learn to understand photography. Everything is a give and take. How do things work? How does light work? What is available to me now? 
And during this process, you're probably going to come up with some new ideas that are creative that you haven't thought of before. And I think that way, when you do go back to your proper camera or something that's designed for much better image quality, you're not just sitting there with an unlimited palette of options that you're not even taking advantage of. You're coming back at it as a photographer and there's something that you've got in mind that you're trying to do. And it's going to be a lot easier to get there. Anyway, I would love to hear what you guys have to say on this. Please leave me a comment. I want to open this for a discussion. And as always, if you've enjoyed this video, please remember to like it, share it, and subscribe to The Art of Photography for more videos. And until the next one, I'll see you guys then. Later.